Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, everyone. Uh, so it is uh, State of the Union week, always an exciting week, although less so for me these days because, you know, I, I still maintain my policy that I do not watch Trump. <laughs> you know, in the old days, you know, even if it was George Bush, I would, you know, block out time, you know, make some snacks, <laughs> get excited, like watch the show in the Twitter days, you tweet incessantly during it. And, you know, for Trump, I'm, I'm not going to give him the satisfaction of, you know, uh, giving him my ratings point, uh, having him be, be a pawn his reality show game. I'll, I'll read the transcript. I'll check the Twitter, Twitter commentary, but I'm not, I'm not going to make a night of it the way I used to. Yeah. Well, we're a little late to the game, but, um, but that's okay. Uh, I still think it's worth talking about. And I have to say, I thought it was very good. I mean, look, who, you know, Trump will have a good night and then he'll – undo it by tweeting crazy things or stirring up some controversy like that's that's a given i'm not going to say he became my president uh or that he's going to pivot but i thought it was a very good speech uh it was very you know it was a very good speech uh i think because it was very strategic it did uh two things that i think uh are, are good ingredients one is he really bragged about all the good things that have happened in the last year which i think we tend to not think about because there's a feeling that things aren't going well but you know he put some points on the board there are metrics that show that things are going well including the economy he stressed that which I think is a very important reminder uh, for him to do and the other thing he did I think incredibly effectively is the whole Lenny Skutnik thing where uh, he really probably more than anybody I've ever seen uh, had people like in the gallery people uh, in the audience that he talked about that were emotional examples of people um, that I think really resonated more than just, you know, saying it. Uh, now, of course, the, cynic, the cynical thing to say is that these are props, but, um, but this goes back to Reagan. Uh, every president since Reagan has done this, and I think that it, it's an emotional way to tell a story uh, and connect it with, with folks, uh, whereas words wouldn't accomplish it. So um, for those two reasons, I thought it was quite quite good so i guess i have two two questions about that so number one on the economy i mean there's not too much dispute that the economy is uh is pointed in the right direction i mean there's still i think some undercurrent whether you know how much of the benefit is really being uh shared by the working class but putting that debate aside uh did trump it's willing to cite the metrics it's another thing to actually get the credit for those metrics there's there is the kind of argument that everything that he's talking about is on the same trajectory that we were already on yeah. under obama you look at the graphs it's not like there's some like sharp pivot upward in the past year it's this it's the same basic slope where you're talking about um you know uh the the jobs numbers or wages yeah. no, uh, like, even, even the gdp numbers are a little a little jagged with obama but it's still not like obama down and trump up you know, it, it, we're the two, the two percent range which Obama was in for 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 several of his years. Uh, it's the, the whole argument for Trump was like that that wasn't good enough. We need to get to like you know three, four, five, and we're certainly not not there yet. Did, did he do something in the speech that I think helps him take the credit? Yeah, no, I, th I think that he said things that were factually true yet misleading. For example, <laughs> uh, the uh, the African American unemployment rate is the lowest in history. Um, and as you meant, you know, just as you alluded to, uh, this is a trajectory uh, that that is not unique to Trump. But technically speaking, he's he's right. He hasn't messed it up. Uh, it's been going in that direction. And he also talked about other stuff. I mean, like ISIS, which I think is another example. You could argue President Obama um, certainly had a role in the defeat of ISIS. But I think it's probably fair to say that Trump does deserve credit. Um, for at least rolling back the caliphate. Um, but he was very eager to to boast and brag about things he's done. And then, of course, through the things like the tax reform, uh, which included um, getting rid of the individual mandate for Obamacare. So he, um, look, I think this is really important. I mean, you, we can talk about it uh, as, as boasting and bragging, but the truth is that you know a lot of Americans just don't feel like things are going well. And um, that, uh, but 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 I think that Trump actually has a much better argument 
if he lays out some bullet points, well, well, this, and that's that's well, what he did. Well, this is always Obama's problem. You know, I mean, you know, there there was a time in the first term where they were talking about recovery summer. Uh, we need to, you know, people don't feel good about the economy, uh, but there are good metrics, and if we don't tout our own metrics, then no one's ever going to feel good about the economy. Uh, I, I think in Obama's case, he was undercut by elements of the left that didn't want to go along with the cheerleading project. They want to emphasize the weaknesses to push for more uh, policy changes. Uh, but is there a risk of Trump uh, sort of, you know, getting over the skis and trying to convince people, hey, things are better than you think when yeah. people don't necessarily feel good about it in in intuitively? I mean, yeah, that's always a risk. But I do think that this is like consistent with his fake it till you make it aspirational ethos. And also when you're Donald Trump and you believe that uh, reality can be um, reality is a matter of perception. Perception is reality. Uh, if things go south later on, you you uh, sort of reinvent reality and, and how you frame it. So I think that that for Trump, um, he's not terribly worried about the, uh, the potential downside of this. Um, and I think, fr frankly speaking, in terms of politics, he's probably right. Um, you know, uh, if nothing else, I think it's fair to say that America needs to have some optimism and positivity. And, you know, um, Barack Obama probably, you know, things are a lot better than they felt during the Obama years. If you look at the... Um, well, we're, we're farther away from the crash. I mean, it's been it's been yeah. almost 10 years since the crash and you would expect things to be better by now. No, no. What I'm saying is that even during the Obama years, we tended to focus on all the negatives, but there's a lot more right with America than there was wrong with America. And um, But part of the job of a leader, I think, is to remind people of our blessings and how good things are. And I mean, so far, Trump and Obama have both kind of failed at that. So my other my other speech question for you is uh, again not having watched it directly myself, but my my sense of it is that the first part of it was along the lines of last year's joint address, where it's like, oh, Trump's being presidential and he's being magnanimous and he's not saying crazy things and may, maybe just as some people said, this is the day he became president, all that kind of stuff, uh, pointing out to the people in the crowd the heartwarming stories that make you feel proud to be an American. But then there was an, an immigration pivot in the speech, which was not unifying, which uh, you know, harping on uh, chain migration, which I think is, is interesting in that you know, Democrats really weren't pushing the family unification point earlier. It was really all about it was all about DACA, all about Dreamers. Uh, there was even, I believe, in Graham Derman's attempt to compromise with Trump on on the family. I mean, just, just so folks understand, the current policy, the current immigration system, uh, you, you, you don't come strictly because there's a job waiting for you. Uh, if you have a family member here, you could, that, that can be uh, a basis for your application. It doesn't mean you're a fifth cousin, so you get to come here tomorrow. There's still long lines. There's still quotas. There's a, 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 so I think the chain might, so conservatives, anti-immigration conservatives call this chain migration to give this sense of a bunch of freeloaders are coming over here who don't have jobs, who then go out and get on welfare and it's killing our country. Uh, but the word chain migration is a made up term. It's not in the law. That's not what it's called in the law. But it's but, not a made up, but it's not a made up term by Donald Trump or Tom Cotton. It's a term, it's a sociological term that's been around for decades. Um, so I don't think that the, um, I don't think it's fair to cast that as like a, uh, some sort of Frank Luntz invented term for this moment to scare people. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's, uh, it, it's being used in that way. It, it, well, it, it has that edge to it that family unification does not have. The problem is that the legal term family unification, which is the legal term, is also a bit misleading because um, even if Donald Trump and Tom Cotton have their way, you would still be able to sponsor your nuclear family. Well, you could well, bring yeah, but, children <laughs> and spouses, but not your aunt and uncle. Right. So, and so, so Trump had this line in the speech where, you know, we're going to protect the nuclear family from chain migration as if bringing over your grandfather is going to destroy the nuclear family. Uh, well, so I would say a couple things. One, I, I think that the 
the most controversial part of Trump's speech um, was not the immigration reform aspect. It was the part where he talked about um, like gangs, you know, like, um, you know, the, the MS-13 stuff. And he had, you know, victims uh, survive, you know, that to me, that was the part that was much more divisive and controversial. Um, but the part where he talked about, you know, this DACA immigration reform, uh, I know I, I know some people didn't like it, but I'm actually um, very optimistic about this. And I, I don't think it's um, I don't think that the current framework that Trump has proposed is, you know, is egregious. I, I think that it's um, I think it's a decent deal. And um it may not be perfect, but I think it's probably the best chance we've had in a long time to actually uh, do something that might eventually lead to um, a pathway to citizenship. So I, I'm I'm more um, optimistic and favorable toward this part of of Trump's uh, of Trumpism. I'm gonna, I'm going to disagree with you very slightly, uh, insofar as I'm not. Um excited about the prospect of this deal. I agree with you. I think we are closer to that deal than the current optics suggest. Uh, but to get back to the to the speech part of it, you know, so so going into this, and I, I can't remember if we spoke after the last shutdown or not. Uh, my, my, my brain's a little fuzzy. Uh, but as you do, I, I do recall, we talked about my piece before the shutdown. Which, yes, and by the way, let's just... Uh, give some kudos there. I don't think we did talk after. And I mean, it feels like the shutdown's been like six months ago, but it was like a week ago. Um, and it was brief and maybe that's part of it, but you you nailed it way ahead of the curve. Thank you. Um, you wrote this piece saying shutdown is for losers and warning Democrats not to do this. They completely ignored your advice. <laughs> Uh, just like Republicans always ignore mine, and uh, but you were right, uh, just like me. Well, so so, so, let, so let's let's walk through the chronology here. I think I think it will it will circle back to your point about the prospects of a deal. So the argument for shutdown is it's going to strengthen your leverage. It's it's the ultimate hardball tactic, or you know, in the opponent's parlance, you're taking the government hostage to get to get your way. Uh, you know, my point in the piece was. The last the times Republicans have done this in 1995 with the budget and trying to uh, have deep cuts in Medicare, and Medicaid, Republicans caved and did not get those things. When Ted Cruz and the House Freedom Caucus led the shutdown to defund Obamacare, they did not defund Obamacare. They did not strengthen their leverage. They subtracted their leverage because people were mad about the shutdown. They took the focus off of the issue they cared about and put it on the fact that Federal workers, you know, uh, you know, line cooks and tour guides are, are not getting their paychecks, uh, and the and the overall economy is uh, taking taking a hit. So, Democrats, I think, fueled by the Im immigration activists who were saying uh, <clears throat> this is an urgent matter. Trump has this March fifth deadline to end DACA, but that's that's a ruse because if you your permit runs out before then. You lose your status before March 5th. You, you already have 15,000 folks without their, their DACA status. Uh, and you have these pressure points with these continuing resolutions to keep the government open. And we had one in November. You had one in December. You're not using them, Democrats, to fix this problem. You best do it in January. And you had various 2020 candidates like Kamala Harris and Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders. They were picking up that baton. I think Schumer really wasn't fully on board with it, but felt kind of boxed in. Uh, and th I, I, I don't want to get crossways with my caucus. I got to try to keep them unified. Uh, and then in doing so, in leading that shutdown, Schumer <laughs> slips in. Hey, I just offered the wall in exchange for DACA and Trump rejected it. He's the one not being bipartisan here. <clears throat> And the day after that, Congressman Luis Gutierrez, who is the, basically one of the biggest advocates for the Dreamers in the House, he says, I don't care how high the wall is built. We just need to help the Dreamers. So Democrats essentially show their cards in that in that moment. And do, in doing so, don't upset the activists. 
Uh, if Schumer offered that deal before the shutdown, as as you you, I always said to yeah. you in this show, Democrats can't offer the wall. I think doing it in the midst of shutdown changed the ability for Schumer to do that and get away with it. Right. Uh, so I was I was technically right on that point. Right. Uh, yeah. So so but so so in doing that, Democrats in the short run get to say Trump's not serious about a deal. Then. The mansion uh, side of the Democratic Party, those folks rebel. We're not doing more shutdowns here, people. This is it's going to get out of hand. Democrats came without really getting a deal in hand. Uh, now you got a blame game where the left is saying yeah. the, the 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 moderates came, and the moderates are saying this was a dumb tactic in the first place. Um, and then Trump comes in with his own deal, as you mentioned, where he offers citizenship to Dreamers and and immediate family to Dreamers in exchange for other hardline anti-immigrant ideas, stopping quote-unquote chain migration, uh, stiff quotas on who can come in after this deal. Um, and Schumer then says, okay, deal's off, the wall's off the table, we're back at square one. And now at the State of the Union address, when Trump mentions chain migration, an issue where Democrats were not being hardline on before, they start to boo. They start to uh, bring up, hey, this is not chain migration. This is family unification. This is important to keep families together. Uh, so it seems like you're even farther away yeah. than you were a month ago. All right, let me make, let me make a, well, a couple. I, 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 just want, I just want to tie this off quickly. Um, okay. But to get to your point, I, I do think a lot of this is for show. I still think Schumer and Gutierrez have shown their cards. What, what both sides have said publicly is not that far apart. Obviously, there, there's points of disagreement, but you're haggling over the, the, you're haggling over the price. Democrats have already said we will give to some degree. Graham Durbin gives on the family unification issue, although the Trump might not enough, but there's already some give there. There's give on wall funding and border security funding. Uh, Maybe they haven't talked so much about the quota issue going forward, but that's that's a number issue. What's the number? Uh, you can see the outlines of a deal. There is a, now a deadline by February 8th to do something with Trump or to throw it on the floor of the Senate and have it hash out the regular order. So I can envision how we get there, but it is notable, I think, that Democrats are starting to try to regain lost leverage by complaining about more things. I don't know how successful that will be and what the exact contours of the final deal will be, but I, I think it is it's somewhat a bit of a kabuki theater moment. So uh, a few thoughts. Um, one is, I know we, we, we joke about Trump playing three-dimensional chess, um, but I do think we are seeing some interesting things happen. So first I would say, like just like the shutdown. Well, no, let me back up. First, I think Trump is expanding the Overton window. So things that used to be deemed out of bounds, uh, he's shifting the goalposts, right? So like there was a time when a wall was unthinkable. Now a wall's thinkable. There was although, a time- Though paid by us and not by Mexico. So Trump had to move a goalpost there. I never thought there. Mexico was- Right, but he had so, to move his own goalpost. Hey buddy, you're actually paying for this, not that. <laughs> sure. Um, but my point is, I think that Trump one of the things Trump is good at is changing the paradigm and expanding the possibilities, things that we used to think, no way you're going to get that, you're crazy, um, are now thinkable. Things that were once unthinkable are now thinkable. And then that expands, right? Once Schumer caves on a wall, now we talk, now we want something else. Now we need this other thing. Second, just like the wall, I'm sorry, just like, by the way, I'm sleep deprived as if people can't tell I'm <laughs> incoherent. Um, I was on Don Lemon late last, on Don Lemon's show late last night. Um, like, so anyway, sleep deprived. Um, uh, just like the shutdown, I think Democrats now find themselves in this unenviable position where, um, so like during the shutdown, they were, you know, Democrats were holding like a losing hand. And I think right now with this chain migration thing, they are like, they're basically, so 
as long as Republicans were saying, we don't want to help dreamers, we don't want them to be citizens, Republicans were going to always lose. Democrats were going to win, Republicans were going to lose. But as soon as Republicans say, hey, we've got a bill that protects dreamers and gives them a pathway to citizenship, and Democrats say, it's not good enough because immigrants can't bring their, their third cousin, now they're in a losing position. So I think that the framing of this benefits Repu Republicans can say, look, we want to give immigrant, you know, dreamers a pathway to citizenship and you're holding that up because they can't bring their uncle. Come on. That's that's not a good position. Well, the last point I'll, the last point I'll make is the fundamentally the reason that I think this that I'm supporting this framework is that it does provide a pathway to citizenship. It legalizes and provides a pathway to citizenship for dreamers. And I think that if this gets done and if the security aspect of this gets done, it would present an opportunity for us to eventually provide a pathway to citizenship for all the undocumented immigrants in this country. Um, it's going to need it's going to take bipartisanship and the conservative base is going to have to be satisfied that there's actually security. Um, that the border is actually secure. And it may be that just as only Nixon could go to China, only Trump has uh, the trust of the base to pull this off. Well, I'm, I'm not nearly as optimistic as you that Trump can get us to a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented. I, I, it's possible you might get there down the line. I don't think it's going to be on, on Trump's watch. But I, I want to agree with you on your point about the, the Democrats' leverage. Yeah. The, the Democrat, the, the, the pro-shutdown caucus belief was you're going to gain leverage by pushing shutdown. Uh, and it may be at the end of this that the narrow goal that Democrats had going in, save the dreamers, they will get that at the end of this process. But they're going to have to give up a lot more, I would argue. I mean, you obviously can't definitely prove one way or the other. I would argue going about it this way has create a situation where Democrats have to say whatever it takes to say the dreamers we will do. I will have to give up many, many concessions in order to save the dreamers because we got impatient and we rushed it and we and and Schumer basically felt I I had to offer the wall to expose Trump's intransigence out of a degree of panic because we're now operating on a com an artificially compressed timeline. You know, the one point that I didn't make earlier was, and I think I made it on the past show, the, the assumption of the activists that you have to do this now because dreamers are already losing their protections was rendered false by a judicial injunction. <laughs> so as of today, DACA exists you can reapply for a fresh two-year permit if, you're, if your permit expired between September and March. Uh, <clears throat> and the response of the activist was, oh, you can't rely on that. That's one judge. It's going to get appealed. It could get appealed any day. Um, the, the general understanding, it, it could certainly get overturned. Um, but it, there wasn't a process that was going to get overturned tomorrow. It might be a few months from now. But you could be racking up your new permits uh, as soon as you can, and, and I grant that there's some bureaucratic lag in restarting the program, but the activist message should be, hey, everybody, let's get those applications in. Let's lock in your two years. You know, you might even get people protected through 2020, <laughs> depending on how the ju judicial process goes. The, the legal wrangling might go on and on, uh, and those every, every program that's stamped is going to be good for two years. And if, if the judicial process doesn't go your way, so maybe there's a point in February or March or April or May where you lose and all of a sudden that DACA deadline is really real. That's your pressure point. <laughs> Clearly, Trump and Ryan and McConnell don't like the optics of deporting dreamers. Otherwise, they'd be deported now. <laughs> They haven't been, de even when the, the permits ran out, Trump wasn't rushing to deport them. Um, they, Trump gave this fake six month deadline so Congress could save his bacon and he wouldn't have to actually deport anybody. Um, yeah. Look, so that, I, so I, that's, I, that's your leverage point. Your leverage point's not shutting on the government. Your leverage point is saying, you, it's on you Republicans 
to save these Germans. If you don't, it's on your heads. Uh, and because they didn't do that, now you, you, you don't get a narrow DACA deal, which is just about DACA. You have to give away the store to get it. Yeah. And look, any negotiation, the person who really want the, the person who wants to deal the most loses. And I will say, look, we, we've we've made fun, uh, I think rightly so, uh, of Donald Trump and the, the sort of the chaos and the incompetence. And I mean, thank goodness for the incompetence. Right. Uh, because my fear was that Trump was going to be this very efficient, like <laughs> authoritarian. So um, but we've sort of made fun of him like, oh, he hires the best people. Look at these jokers. He's hired. Well, you know what? He maybe this is the art of the deal. Maybe we are just now seeing the I, negotiation. I, I, I think that, he's that, completely, gives, that gives him way way too much credit. This is this is the Democrats blundered 20, into this, and Trump's taking advantage. But I don't think this if is. We're, if we're looking at 2018 in isolation, he is running circles around the Democrats in 2018. I I, I think it's giving him way too much credit. Um, Democrats had a better hand here. Trump Trump and the Republicans were ones who were scared of. Uh, the deportations. Uh, and you, you had Republicans saying before the shutdown, oh, March 5th, that's not even a hard deadline. Trump can push that back. Uh, we, we, they were not ready to pull the trigger. They want to keep punting and punting and punting and not actually deport anybody. And Democrats could have used that to their advantage. So your point, who wants to deal more? Now Democrats have no choice. If they got out of this without any of our dreamers, Man, that would be a bloodbath with the progressive base. They need to at least deliver say, on that, which is why they got to their concessions. In my political recollection, Republicans have never won a shutdown fight. Mm -hmm. In my political recollection, Republicans have always been on defense uh, in terms of dreamers. And now I think Republicans are on offense on both of these because— the strategy is, as I just to reiterate what I said, we have a plan that will protect the dreamers and you're going to oppose it because even though we're going to let them bring their kids and <laughs> sponsor their kids and spouses, they can't bring their parents, you know, and, who, and that's, who, an, and that's an argument the Democrats have not laid the groundwork for. I mean, I, I think it's a very strong argument for broader family unification, but Democrats have not been making it until they start booing at the State of the Union address. It's a losing argument. Look, we can talk about family values and we can talk about, uh, you know, it takes a village and it's great to have your, your, your aunt and uncle, but I don't think the average American is going to side with them on that. I think it's a losing hand, which is amazing, by the <laughs> way, that Donald Trump and the Republicans at this point, they they've been known to grasp defeat from the jaws of victory. But that I think the framing of this is pretty surprising. And I have to give the Trump and the Republicans credit, I think, for uh, for, for their uh, sagacity on this. Uh, I want to shift topic. We, we cut to one more topic, I think, before we have to go. And uh, I actually wrote a piece for Politico about the Democratic responses to the State of the Union address, which have not gotten that much attention except for this ridiculous uh, claim that Kennedy was drooling <laughs> in the middle what of the speech. What was that? I think it was chapstick. I think it was just like okay. a, little, or a little makeup or something or other. I mean, yeah. and it, whatever. Who cares if it was drool? So what? We all have little it's, things sometimes. No, it's we all do. And God, you know, God knows those of us who uh, who I mean, I, I probably have something on me now. I mean, <laughs> but but in fairness, I mean, Marco Rubio just did take a glass, take a drink of water. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and, and that was and that was a cheap shot in Rubio. It, it, the, the water didn't have anything to do with the content of his speech. You know, Jindal's pathetic State of the Union was not just a sort of goofy demeanor, but he was also say he was saying ridiculous things about volcanoes, you know, in the speech. Uh, so that was more of a substantive critique of, of Jindal. The Rubio thing was sort of like, ha ha, you're, you're, you're this up and coming rock star in your cave and, you know, drink water before you speak. Uh, but obviously that's that's kind of cheap and the can thing's kind of cheap. The important thing is, like, what are they saying? What What is behind, what's the strategy behind what they're saying? Uh, and, and it's not just Kennedy's speech. You also had, there's a Spanish language speech by a, a, new, a Virginia state legislature, um, 
uh, Elizabeth Guzman. Uh, Bernie Sanders had his own uh, response on his social media platforms, which he also did after Trump's joint address last year. And you have the Working Families Party, which many folks don't know too much about, uh, but they've been around for, for a long time, actually, about a couple decades. They, they're a third party, which generally tries not to be Green Party-like and undercutting Democrats. They try to pull Democrats to the left and usually don't run candidates against uh, Democrats in the general election. They tend to endorse people in primaries or offer ballot lines where they're active in states uh, so people could, you know, you could vote for the incumbent Democrat, but vote for them on the working family's line to say, I want you to follow the working family's platform when you're in office or sort of an indication of your ideological bent. Uh, so that's their, that's been their MO. Uh, Donna Edwards, who was a congressman, congresswoman from Maryland, always been seen as kind of a progressive up and comer. She tried to make the jump to Senate last year, lost in the primary to Chris Van Hollen. Now she's running for county executive in suburban Prince George's County. Uh, so she gives a response for the Working Families Party. She had four responses on Tuesday night. I think Maxine Waters did something on Wednesday night, which I haven't even seen, but I wasn't really counting that in my my piece because I wrote it before that. Um, so there's this argument that this is cacophonous. You know, all these different, there's, there's, there's no one voice for the Democrats. Bernie's still out there keeping the progressive flame alive and undercutting the, the party establishment. And now working families is jumping in the mix too. Uh, but let's remember in the Obama years, we had Tea Party responses. Start with Michelle Bachman in 2011. Rand Paul did his own responses throughout those years. One time, Paul gave the Tea Party response. Uh, the Michelle Bachman speech, uh, famously not looking at the camera. Right, right. Uh, uh, although, if we're gonna, if we're gonna Bachman, talk about weird things in that speech. Well, funny, the Bachman speech happened that way because uh, it was actually being aired on the cable networks, which Bernie's response and Don Ember's response was not, as far as I know. Uh, it was so novel that that she was doing, and they thought it would, and, and they probably thought it would be a glorious train wreck. So they they all aired it, and there was a pool camera in there that was different than the Tea Party Express camera, and she was looking in the Tea Party camera, not in the pool camera. So she looked off kilter. Um, Bernie's uh, response on Tuesday had its own technical problem. It actually went offline for two minutes. Uh, and he came back and was like, uh, you know what they say about technology? It's great when it works. I mean, if that happened on live television, it would have been a much bigger deal, but it only went out to his fans and so nobody really noticed. Um, so my point there is, even though Bachman did that, even though Rand Paul did his thing, it didn't help Rand Paul and Michelle Bachman very much. Neither one of them became president or the nominee. But No, but I mean, we did get Donald Trump, and maybe yeah, that's indicative yeah of something uh, of a certain chaos and 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 the fact that the the party the the official party uh infrastructure and, and elites no longer have control they no longer sing off the same choir sheet i mean i do think it's a commentary on the state of our politics today right right so uh you can't assume it's going to play in exactly the same way for the democrats that there'll be some Democrat, socialist, Bernie, or otherwise, who gets the nomination. But it's evidence that those tectonic plates are are moving. The divisions still remain. But if you actually read the speeches, there are a lot of similarities. They're different. They're different and similarities. So it's not like, and you didn't see Sanders and Edwards taking pot shots at Kennedy or pot shots at Pelosi and Schumer. They're all basically doing their own thing. Uh, they all were. Uh, talking up dreamers and, and immigration generally. Uh, they all were uh, uh, critical of the tax bill. Uh, they all avoided gun control by and large. They all avoided foreign policy by and large. They want to stay on domestic economic issues. Uh, but they had some big differences. Namely, Kennedy doesn't even mention Trump by name the entire time talks about the past year the administration they you know he's speaking on a, on broadcast television he's got an eye towards swing voters that voted for trump he doesn't want to make this personal about about him bernie's entire speech was here's all of trump's lies here's the <laughs> issues trump didn't say even goes to, goes as far as say americans don't want a president who's a bully who's dishonest 
as if we're not talking about 2018, we're talking about 2020. Um, now, Bernie does not mention impeachment. He does not mention the special counsel investigation. He's a little passage about Russia. Uh, but he doesn't, he doesn't talk about Trump's scandals. He talks about Trump's economic policy for the most part. Uh, Dinah Edwards um, has a passage about <clears throat> Trump upending the rule of law and undermine the special counsel investigation. It doesn't say impeachment, but makes a point of pressing that line. So that shows some division within the progressive populist community. Are we talking about Trump's issues? Or are we talking about Trump's scandals? You know, there's not consensus there. Um, so uh, you don't have a, a singular... Uh, and I should also say that the Spanish language uh, address was also more pointed towards Trump. Trump is trying to deport our families. Trump is deba- abandoning Puerto Rico. You know, things that uh, Kennedy did not make as personal in, in his address. So you can look at that two different ways. You know, tailoring messages to different audiences, that's going to help different demographics be energized and turn out on election day 2018. Uh, or you could say this shows that they can't come to agreement. What is the strategy? And this is going to come out uh, uh, being kind of a muddle uh, in 2018. And even if the party establishment doesn't want to alienate those Trump voters, they're going to hear Bernie and they're going to hear other people making those people even talking about impeachment, even though Bernie wasn't doing that, talking mm-hmm. about the council investigation, not talking about their pocketbook, and that's going to overshadow what the broader party establishment wants. I can't say today how exactly that that's going to look like. Uh, I can say that that kind of uh, disagreement on the Republican side didn't stop them from winning in 2014 midterms, didn't stop Donald Trump from taking over the party and winning in 2016. So you can't assume it's it's terrible. But you certainly can wonder, even if Democrats can kind of keep together for 2018, these things are bound to manifest in 2019, 2020 in the presidential primary. And that's when the Republican Civil War really started to play out and led to Trump. So uh, it's worth noting the path we may be on. Be afraid. afraid. (laughs) All right. uh, Another award winning episode, Bill Share. Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to talk to you, Matt Lewis. Yeah, you got, read you, got your... you, you got fun podcast guests coming up, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk some FBI today. Uh, but let me plug um, one that's up right now. Uh, I interviewed John Avlon uh, of a little website we call The Daily Beast and, and a little TV channel we call CNN, who talked about his book Washington's Farewell, Bill. You would be all over this. This is <laughs> this is a Bill Sherr podcast. So check it out at iTunes, Matt Lewis and the News. And then uh, stay tuned for some other stuff I got coming up over there. Uh, and Bill, what's uh, Politico, your Politico piece? Um, they gave it a, a long title. The name was escaping me. But if you go to politico.com slash magazine, you will see my piece about the Democratic responses uh, up, up near the top. And check us out at DMZ Show on Twitter. We'll see you all here next week. All right. Take care.